have a kiddo who is out of control? That's my question. You want to know why your kiddo is acting the way they are? Why does autism cause these behaviors? The number one reason, in my experience, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a professional, I'm just a mom. It's sensory processing issues. They're just not getting the right information up to their brains. The signal's blocked. So if their sensory systems are hooked up improperly, which they are, and if they've been diagnosed with autism, an automatic co-diagnosis is going to be sensory processing disorder. If they have autism, they have sensory processing disorder. They can have sensory processing disorder and not have autism, but not the other way around. If they have autism, they have sensory processing disorder. So um, you can have a system that feels things too intensely or feels things not enough and both cause problems. You can also, more, more likely than not, you are going to have a kiddo who does both some things are too sensitive, some things are too dulled down. So we'll go over some of those things, but there's no way I can cover all of it because autism is a spectrum and so everybody has different symptoms. Some kiddos might run into the corner of a table and get a big goose egg on their head and not respond at all. That would be um, an example of a kid with a dulled down sensory system. They are not getting that s signal to their brain that they have been injured and so they just keep on going, they keep on playing. Another thing that can happen and is really common, especially when I worked as a, um, a developmental therapist, was when they receive an overly aggressive signal to their brain um, that is indicating that something's more um, invasive than it actually is. That is one of the hallmarks of um, sensory issues that kids with autism can navigate because that's what's causing behaviors. If their sensory system is dulled down and they're just getting bumped on the head and not crying, they're just, they can be written off as tough. But when they have um, a, an assumption a severe reaction to something that's normal like a hand dryer at a public restroom and they're on the floor screaming with their hands cupped over their ears then it's a little more noticeable that something's going on so why are these invasive sounds or sensations of any kind even personal touching or the sound of a public toilet flushing because it's a super loud toilet why are they causing such problems in our sensory sensitive kids? And the reason is it was so loud and their little ears were hooked up a lot more sensitively than the rest of ours. And so instead of it sounding like a toilet flush or a air flowing through to, to dry your hands, it was like this invasive attack on their system that, that sounded like it was going to actually cause them harm because it was so loud. Imagine a freight train coming right at your head and it sounds like it's right there already. They can see with their eyes that it's not, but their ears are telling them otherwise. This causes them to do just crouch in pain, covering their ears with their hands. Um, my kids do it with the blender. Um, yeah, all sorts of situations. So the number one reason that you're seeing behaviors in these kids is that their sensory system is hooked up wrong. So my goal in this video is to hopefully help you understand that just a little bit and give you some tools because there's no way that I can cover everything that each kid with autism is going to navigate. That's why autism is called spectrum. Everybody um, has different aversions, different um, things that they need to help them cope. So. Um, the best thing I can do it from one mom to another is to give tools. Tools that have helped me and hopefully will help you too. So that's my goal in making this video today. And um, yeah, let's dig into it. So I have a couple kiddos. I have two diagnosed with sensory processing disorder. And um, one of them is diagnosed with autism and ADHD. Um, the other one I'm sure probably would be diagnosed with ADHD, but he's only four and we just haven't crossed that bridge yet. So, um, and then I've also had five, uh, 
sorry, five kids total at the time, but three foster kids. Um, so they were not related to me. They all had the same birth mom, but all three had different biological dads. So lots of different genetics um, and lots of different levels of autism. All three of them had autism. There was one who was intellectually impaired and um, she could not speak. She didn't understand because um, a lot of people with autism, they understand, but they can't articulate. They can't get their words out if they're nonverbal with autism. But this little gal was also intellectually impaired. And so she, she couldn't understand a lot. Um, and then I had another little guy who was uh, six years old and he was super high functioning. He needed help with um, potty training. He um, had some behaviors. He held himself like he just needed some sensory inputs and he was he had some aversions as well. Um, he had some low muscle tone, but he was high functioning, um, did have the autism diagnosis. And then my last little guy was uh, five. He had autism and intellectual impairment as well. Um, but he could understand it a little bit more than big sis. And he, um, he was starting to say little words. Um, and so anyways, just to give you an idea of the kiddos that I've got, my, my biological daughter with autism, she's I would say mid-functioning now, and at the time of diagnosis, she was diagnosed as mid-functioning. She could put together sentences, but she was severe in the fact that it was hard to get her attention. She was in her own little world. She really, if she was in a highly stressful environment like a classroom or a, a gym where there was lots of noise and stuff going on, she would lose the ability to speak. She would lose language and um, behaviors were very intense. Um, she was a fecal smearer. Um, she, there was a lot of yucky things <laughs> that we'd navigated and um, she got diagnosed with pica, eating things that aren't food. Um, so she was um, extremely challenging, maybe even my most challenging, more so than the completely nonverbal ones. Um, and then my little boy, my biological little boy with sensory processing disorder. He has behaviors that are related to sensory aversions or sensory seeking um, events. So I have had a fair amount of exposure to um, autism and sensory processing disorder and some other challenges. My goal for this video is to just give a couple of tips. Um, I will try and link to this video. Maybe I'll just do it right here. This is the first time I've done it. So I'll see if I can make something pop up right here. If I can't, you'll know I failed because it's here in the video. <laughs> but um, I want something to pop up right here. That is a link to a book that has been so helpful. You just type in your kiddos um, sensory aversion or their sensory seeking, like um, washing their hands freaks them out. You, um, you don't type it in, you look it in the index. And if they have that or something like it, it gives you the page number. So for instance, scared of washing hands. I would look up scared or fearful in the table of contents. And if I saw it, it would give me a page number. I go to that page number and it just tells me why, like a brief little summary of why and ideas of how to help. So um, for instance, it could be just that it's um, the noise of the water coming on is, is terrifying. They can hear um, their, their sense of hearing is way more amplified than ours. And so it's like, freaking them out. And so then they give ideas like maybe use hand sanitizer, don't turn the water on so loud, maybe let them turn it on and show them how they can do it um, gently or with more pressure, um, give them some of that control. So that book, I will also put in the description below just in case my, my link doesn't work. And that is an excellent resource to just start understanding why some of these sensory issues are happening and what you can do to help. So that is like number one, um, I will just give you a couple of the things that helped my kiddos. Um, one of the things was um, my one, my little girl who was eight um, and she was nonverbal. One thing that helped her to calm and even be ready for bed was they had these little brushes. I'll have to see if I can find them online and put them in the description below, but you just brush. It, it almost looks like just a little 
rectangle with little plastic bristles and she just loved to have her arms brushed and I as I was learning about autism and sensory brushing was a huge thing for a lot of kids with autism and that she just loved she would do it to herself she would just brush her arms brush her legs brush just everywhere and that would just calm her down she also loved wind wind had just a happy calming effect on her it was like she was in her happy place. However, my biological daughter, if you get her in wind, she's terrified, she's melting down. It is like the end of the world and she, you know, she had to go to her bed. We called it her decompression time. And she would put on a weighted blanket because it was nice and firm, made her feel safe. The room was dark, lights were off, nothing visually stimulating, and that helped her to calm down. Um, so if you can find what what sensations help to calm the sensory system down, you're actually ta helping take that kid out of fight or flight. And so that's the very first thing that needs to happen before your kid can start processing the world around them. Um, I talked to an adult who had autism and he said, before I could worry about being polite or um, about being concerned about how someone else felt or have compassion on somebody, I had to feel safe. Like I wasn't going to be attacked in the next moment. And if you've ever seen the movie Temple Grandin, um, it helps you understand just a little bit. Like just the sound of a ceiling fan or fluorescent lights buzzing, that can make an autistic child, especially because they haven't had as much time to learn about their environment, they don't know what these new sensations are, that can make them feel like um, there is something about to attack them because they don't know what it is and it's so invasive and so intense that they are, that's why they're freaking out. Like it, a humming of a refrigerator may sound like a semi truck coming right at their head, but they can't figure out where it's coming from. And so if you're saying, please don't chew with, or speak with your mouth full, um, they're not hearing that. They are worried about the semi truck coming at their head and where it's at and they're under the table screaming because this sensation is so overwhelming and terrifying. So if we can figure out ways to help them find what calms them down, then we can start doing all the other stuff. I, I wanna do videos on um, how to transition without tantrums and um, how to implement manners and um, cooperative play with peers. But before we can do that, we have to figure out what their sensory aversions or preferences are and how to calm down that sensory system, get them out of fight or flight, make them feel safe, and then they can start to process the world around them. I also did another video on foods, um, foods, just eating foods that inflame, I think it's inflaming the gut and creating neuroblockers that kind of block um, signals from getting to the brain. So that can be another thing. If you um, are interested, watch this video. See if I can do it again. Right there, video right there. If not, it'll be in the description below. Um, and that may be helpful too because um, there can be some foods that are causing a um, reaction to where the kids can't process the world. So if you can remove some of those foods, that may also help unlock their world. Um, so just doing some of this preliminary work before we're even diving into behavior or um, manners or anything else like that, we're working on these things that are attacking their sensory system. We don't get it if we don't have it. And um, we've got to exercise just some, um, I think, think sensory system um, intelligence and um, figure out if our kids are terrified, they're not gonna be interested in anything else because they're just trying to survive. So um, yeah, uh, hopefully this video can help somebody um, figure out what things help calm their kids.